Hey there. It's very nice to have you joining us here again for another virtual pinup of the MACAD. This is the last virtual pinup, and we are going to be following up with the studio final presentations, which I, I guess and I hope you're all ready for. <clears throat> Um, this is a presentation that is part of the MACAD, uh, Master in Advanced Ar uh, Computation for Architecture and Design, um, that is focused on teaching the latest digital software um, and computational strategies relevant in the AEC field today. Um, we, of course, count on a amazing uh, team of uh, international guests, um, international faculty, and of course, uh, students from all over the world. <clears throat> And we are in, in this uh, module that is called BIM and Smart Construction. We are trying to uh, disentangle the most relevant paradigms um, of BIM um, and the, the uh, most interesting aspects of it, which, which are integrative modeling, collaborative workflows, and uh, cloud-based data management. Um, Today, the, the course for today is called um, Collaborative Workflows, Digital Tools for, for Collaborative Workflows. And it was given by Ellen Ryan um, together with the assistant, uh, Noelia Rodriguez. Uh, so Ellen is a Spanish building engineer uh, that is specialized in computational um, design and digital fabrication. And he's currently an AEC software engineer at Speckle. And with this, I will give the word to him to introduce the course, uh, the format for the presentation, um, and to actually start this discussion. Thank you, Anna. Uh, well, welcome all to, to this presentation. Uh, and thank you for attending, the ones that can do so live. Um, so uh, as Anna very well said, I've, we've been the, doing this class about collaborative workflows. And today we'll be seeing the results of the 10 different groups uh, uh, that will be presenting in a pre-recorded manner. And then we will have like a quick discussion around uh, each of the different topics and presentations. Uh, the main goal of this uh, course was to uh, not, not uh, uh, fix ourselves into like the actual design that we were uh, that each of the groups were doing, but try to uh, do a step back and uh, understand and document how is the how is the collaborative strategy that they had to come up with to make this design happen uh, as a team, not only as uh, as independent uh, modelers or or specialists, but uh, how they kind of like work together. Uh, and co uh, collaboratively sent and received data. And this was done uh, mainly using the Speckle uh, platform, which is an open source platform for the data collaboration. Uh, but they were also uh, welcome to use other uh, tools that they've been using in their in other of their subjects, like Rhino Insight and other like the other of the latest like plugins and and tools available. Uh, so we will see like a little bit of mix and match of, of everything throughout the course. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with me and Noelia as my assistant, we also have today uh, Kim Moya and Claire Kwang, uh, which I will allow them to present themselves. Uh, they will do a much better job than I would. So if you want, Claire, please uh, go on. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. I am Claire. I am Alan's co-worker at Speckle. I uh, just joined a couple months ago, um, also working as a software engineer. Prior to that, I spent a few years working at Gary Tech doing computational design and um, just project consulting and also a lot of automation on the back end as well. Um, my background is in architecture and math. I did an undergrad in math and then switched to a four-year master's at Harvard GSD, uh, just capital A architecture. <laughs> um, so glad to be on a review today and looking forward to seeing the videos. Cool, glad to have you. Kim, if you want to. Hi, I'm an architect and I'm totally working in reception development in Apogea. And we're studying different digital techniques uh, applied to architecture. So this is more or less what we are doing now, essentially technological stuff. So 
this everything they're doing. I think Alan knows what I'm speaking about. Yeah, yeah. Kim is basically, basically an awesome researcher and does uh, has wears many hats. So he might be doing some AI research and at the same time doing some automation in Revit and everything in between. <laughs> so yeah. it's a fun it's a fun position to to be at. Yeah. Sometimes it's stressing, but <laughs> this this part of the work. Cool. So now that we've done the honors and introduced the jury, let's go ahead with the with the first group. Um, I'm gonna kind of we we were going to follow like the group numbering order, but I've kind of like swapped it a little bit to give preference to the people that are in like the latest part of the day right now. Uh, so if they were attending, they could have a chance to, to actually view their, their presentation. Uh, and then we would kind of go in order more or less. Uh, so there's no specific order in mind. Uh, with that said, let me just prepare this to pop open. And See if I can also share my screen. Mm -mm -mm. Does this also share the audio of the screen? Let's see. Could you? Can you um, hear this? I think you have to check the uh, share audio when you are uh, in your share screen options. Ah, wait a second. Then. And optimize for video would be also good. Advanced computer audio. Okay, one second. Sorry for the slight technical delay. Uh, Uh, okay, this thing is complaining now about something. You are what? just sharing the sound now. <laughs> ah. uh, uh, and share my screen. There you go. Hopefully you can hear this. Um, uh, no, it's coming out of my yes. mic. One second. Ah, I'm lost here in this this Zoom thing. Uh, um, Alan, I can I can share the first. Okay, video. thank you. As I, while I deal with this this issue. Yes, uh, let me just find it. So I was going to play Group Four, which is Great. Felipe Romero, Kisava, and Basel. Oh, yes, one second, Joanna, I'll send you the link. Uh, it's faster that way. <laughs> yeah, sorry for the slight delay there. Uh, let's see, get a bit more close. Uh, no worry, I got it. Ah, okay, perfect. Cool, thanks, Anna. <laughs> Sorry for that. No worry. Can you let me know if everything is working well? 
It seems to be appearing correctly. Great. So hi, everyone. Um, this right. is a presentation for the digital tool for collaboration workflows. Our team is group four. We are the sports centrifuge. And we are Felipe Quechua Ambassador. So today our presentation is going to be divided into three main sections where we basically will go, to go through the main workflow and we, ex we will explain a bit of like the step and step and, and at the end, some of the speculative streams that we use. So for the main workflow and interactions, so we, our project was divided into three different phases. So the first one was the form exploration process that it was done in Maya and Rhino, then followed by a form and refinement parametrization that it was done in Rhino and Grasshopper. And finally, we had a documentation and detailing process that it was done in Revit. Um, pretty much we used uh, Rhino and Rhino Insight and Speckle to transfer data in between the different softwares. So for the main workflow interactions, our project was split or divided into three into eight sections. Um, so the first uh, was the context model where we create a context data stream. And then the parallel, we had a geometry um, model where we, has, we had an, as an output like facade and floor plates and the torus, and that was our geometry stream. And then at point number three, they were converged into the context and massing model, where we basically generate three different streams out of it. And we generate the facade optimization, the torus detailing, the floor plates, and for the internal distribution. And then we send that back to Revit and just to produce all the documentation and the further detail. So now we are going to explain a little bit of like the step by step process for the sections. And so we start with the context um, model and where we basically, we had as an input, uh, we had an terrain as a surface and a project point where it was the location of that project in, in the terrain and then a boundary, which is was like a sphere containing that they were all massing. We did the same for the geometry process and we had like different elements, the facade, the, the floor plans and the torus as our main geometry drive. And then we follow with the context and massing where we basically combine bo both models and we have a little bit more of detailing in relationship to these, the project into the terrain. So for all of, for all of these uh, step-by-step, step, we generate different streams and then we were uh, playing with the, the streams. And now I will pass it, pass it up to Keshawa. Yeah. So then the base geometry and the context and the terrain were taken from the previous streams and combined to um, generate a more detailed model, which is required for a design. So in this stream, uh, the Sorry. design was, uh, yeah, the design was refined to produce the structure and the and the facade panels, uh, which was optimized using uh, using K-means clustering, and and the internal structure and the flow uh, was added in the stream. Then uh, the facade de and then the torus was also detailed uh, to to a sufficient uh, extent and was later added into these uh, <clears throat> into the overall building. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So here, uh, then after uh, getting these streams uh, from uh, individual uh, people, then we kind of combined the whole uh, whole model in Revit uh, using uh, using the attributes we got from uh, Speckle and uh, Rhino. Uh, using um, so the floor plates and the floor finishes were uh, Revit native, and uh, the uh, and the facade panels were modeled using adaptive components in Revit. Uh, by taking uh, the data from Grasshopper. So yeah, I mean, next slide. So here we uh, have just tabulated our uh, speckle streams in the next slide. So yeah, so this is how we work, so thank you. Yeah, so just finally, so we had like different streams and then all of them, they were linked back to Revit. And 
in Revit, we had the um, uh, we took all the, the Rhino geometry and we start like detailing a little bit more the um, using like as Keshava mentioned adaptive components and native geometry in Revit, and that was it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think it's been you've done a, an amazing job of of uh, kind of splitting it up and and explaining very nicely what are the different steps in your in your workflow and who was doing what and and how did all of that had to come together later uh, in order to detail it and and kind of like produce a, a, an accurate model that you can use in in a professional setting and actually produce shop drawings for it. Uh, so. A uh, very good job, in my opinion. Uh, not sure if, if Claire, Noelia, or Kim want to jump in to, to elaborate. Uh, maybe the question of parameters in, in the Revit model. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have not a clear idea of what, what kind of parameters they have added to this element. But it will be interesting because uh, at the end, in Revit, it's not only a problem of geometry, that is obviously uh -huh. a, a great deal. I mean, it's it's really important, but also the, the information that this model contains. So maybe it will be interesting, maybe to know uh, how this information is flowing in all this process. Okay, so no, you, you would have also would like would like to would have liked to also see not only like what Revit families and how they were creating them, but also a, like an inner deeper view on on yeah. how those Revit families were actually, what data were they were actually holding. Yeah, you know? ah, yeah, okay. yeah, it's yeah, it's a good point. It's a, it's a very good point. Yeah, I, I would second that. I think seeing specifically the grasshopper definition and then what data is being passed to Revit and the sort of um, advancement in the assembly or the level of detail from the grasshopper model to, to Revit would have been um, a great like deeper dive <laughs> into the process. Cool. Cool. No idea, anything to add? Sorry, no, more or less like the the Claire and more um, Kim comment. But a good I think it's a, a good work. Yeah, I, like I think it's a, it's a good overview in general, maybe it is missing because I am aware that they were they were also like setting, it, it wasn't also like the geometry that they were sending there was mm -hmm. more but like maybe the format was more restrictive and and kind of like they, they compounded like the main points which was the main idea behind the the exercise uh, but yeah also uh, in a in a more general generic comment uh, it would have also been useful to see a deeper like how those the Revit elements uh, if they had some data, what data would, were, were they being uh, uh, attached uh, to its instance? Uh, but yeah, generally very good job of, of, of the presentation, giving the, the presentation restric restrictions, no? uh, which were in five minutes, you have a limit of how much you can, you can actually say. Uh, so let me see uh, if I can now share my screen and run a, an actual uh, video myself. Uh, VLC, where are we? There you go. So let's run, uh, 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 let's run group five, for example. I had someone else in my, in my list, uh, not sure who. Not group five, Juana, <laughs> group two? Okay, let's do group two then. Uh, Hello. One second, I will see if this actually wants to do its thing. And share screen, advanced video, share. Uh, uh. Mission group two, this one. Aha. Uh -huh. Let me know if it Hello. actually works. My name is Natalie. It works, Today yeah. We will draw and Sergey were group awesome. number two. As a group, 
we got together to decide one of the best strategy for collaboration, given the nature of our studio project. Depending on the stage of the design process, different ways of working uh, require different approaches. We decided that for the initial exploration of form and concept, we would divide the project into parts, each part being the consequence of its own grasshopper scripts. Uh, the fuss is requires lots of back and forth, every member contributing to all parts of the building, forest trees, tunneling, bombing, shells, and terrain. After that, we divided the whole building into different parts for further development, developing. Each member was the responsibility to develop his part, introducing further detail and an analysis of the geometry with the different plugins. Sergei, for, uh, um, for example, for the surface elements, draw um, the underground and either in terrace and the shells. Finally, we got to the path to refine and documenting. This is about finalizing the design, creating visualizations and technical drawings. For this, we created links between the members of our project discussion and combined efforts uh, to achieve a final model. The building is divided, is illustrated here. It was not about the initial geometry anymore, but about grouping it in a way that suited the intent of the design. Surface elements are strongly connected to the sun. Shells are related to the pragmatic functions. And underground is about the chosen construction method bombing. Now, Joao. So this is a diagram for the group workflow. We have four grasshopper scripts that generate initial geometry, and each of those is streamed independently. We then introduce a buffer stage to have control over how each of those initial geometries is streamed to each group member. Here we break down those initial geometries into packages according to the needs of detailed development. Since it is at this stage that we have a, a simple geometry of the building, we stream it to the shared colony model. From here, each member of the group has its own local Rhino file receiving a specific package. And we also introduce streams to communicate design intentions with each other creating live links between the local files, although we have to say Speckle had a hard time handling our heavy geometry and we still required some file transfers. Uh, to close this workflow, each member streams his final design into a common model from where we use Rhino inside Revit to export the technical documentation. Here we can have a look into the data pipeline we created. Bombing model sends the cave meshes and implant implantation points as Speckle objects. Forest model sends three types of tree, structure, of tree structures as speckle objects nested inside one aggregating object. And the same is happening for the tunneling model, but instead of aggregating by type, we do it by vertical and horizontal tunnels. Shell models include information about the function of each, of each shell. And finally, the terrain model sends the location of each connection point of the building, the terrain itself as a mesh and the topo lines as curves. After going through the aggregation and distribution process, three streams are sent out, including different pieces of the original geometry streams according to the design intent. After all the detailing, we reach the final model. <clears throat> Here it's possible to see how the building elements are translated into aggregated elements for detailing. Parts of the bomb caves are, and tunnel objects go into two different streams, um, while forests and tunnels go in one stream each. Terrain, of course, is sent out to, to the three, three, three streams. And this is a visualiza visualization of what happens locally for each member. The building gets developed with new information and then sent out in final streams. Um, here, uh, we have set up a few slides showing what happens uh, when changes are uh, need to happen. Uh, in this example, uh, I have decided to change the locations of the trees after running a solar study. Uh, in this case, uh, I simply go to the model uh, that, I, uh, that generates the original position of the forest, update it, and receive the changes uh, in my own detailing model. Then, in the next case, uh, Natalie changes the size of the water tank after new volumetric calculations. This implies a change in the bombing model that generates the cave, so after the update, both Joao and Natalie need to receive the new geometry from the bomb cave speckle object on their ends. Finally, Joao rethinks the location of the explosion. This will imply updating both the tunneling model and the bombing model. So in this case, all the members need to update their, their detailing stream. But the process is fairly simple and there, uh, uh, there is 
isn't much space for errors to occur in the process, except for the size of the models being sent to and fro. Uh, finally, we get to the stream metrics. Uh, we used five grasshopper streams for the initial geometry, three individual streams for detailing and three individual streams to share changes and updates to other members and three final streams to merge all the parts into a final model. Here, it is possible to see the speckle environment of the group. On the left, all the streams used. On the right, the streams each member is managing to accomplish the full collaboration. And this is the final project living inside the speckle online viewer. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, awesome. Well, I think it was a great presentation. Uh, personally, I really did like uh, the way you uh, kind of like presented the different uh, parts of geometry and tied it up with the different streams that you're sending and receiving, but also the fact that you have actually analyzed uh, what would happen in different scenarios and with different changes in your project, which is something uh, that is very useful to think about uh, while you're setting all of these collaboration workflows up. And uh, a very good uh, point was that, that that extra step of, of creating some extra streams to kind of like cross data together between users and, and check that, that everything that you're updating in the last step of your process is actually correct and you can react to any changes uh, faster. So uh, and generally uh, an amazing job uh, throughout the entire presentation i'll leave the hi, yeah. hi um Alan. i just wanted to add the background information that i'm uh, sure the jerry doesn't have um, and also our viewers don't have uh, and we should have given it so the all the students have used as a support for this for this um, speckle exploration that they did they have all used um, their studio projects um, which we will uh, go through in more detail in the in the following uh, two events, um, which is the studio projects presentations. Um, but th this studio projects uh, brief was to to uh, create a very various programs in a new colony on the moon um so this is why we are talking about uh bombing and um and different uh, kind of solar studies and uh, and uh, this sort of uh, not really um out out of the world um examples and geometry um and the the intention with the studio project was to actually push the students to to explore more complex geometries and and um, get away from the the known and the status quo uh, that is uh, here on, on or in the normal um building scenario on earth um, I just wanted to give you this information and also wanted to, to add that part of their um, initial research in this in the studio um, was to uh, to use speckle as a full group of, of the 30 students. Um, so between this uh, 10, 10 different groups to use speckle to to basically share with among themselves information of where their project is located um, and how their project connects to others other projects in the colony so that's why you probably in the di diagrams you always will see a stream going to the colony <laughs> um, sorry i should have given this um this presentation no worries. A bit earlier <laughs> <laughs> no worries thanks for, thanks for the clarification for everyone attending uh, the context definitely helps quite a bit. I really enjoyed that presentation because I like that the emphasis was not on separating or defining the process on individual geometry or form driven um, of values. It was more around uh, performative aspects of what the design on the whole needed to do. So when you separate a system um, based off of each requirement, like optimizing, uh, like with the trees, the solar, um, performance of the design, for instance, when you when you initially design your workflow to isolate by performance, it allows you to optimize and uh, kind of contain where the 
changes might need to happen where clashes in the existing or previous versions might exist with new developments. So I think that was really um, a really smart way to approach the design on the whole rather than to um, kind of divide it up into building assemblies or by form as you typically see in a project. Yeah, I, I think that something that is very, very interesting here is, is how it advances in the process and then goes back. And this this process of going back, of uh, adding the conceptual design in all the process, I think it's it's fundamental. And it's something that I, I, I'm extremely interested in that because uh, this ability to change everything and then all the workflow is able to uh, integrate this change very quickly. Okay, I think I think this this is something very very good in this project. Okay, something uh, I really admire, really. Very nice. Nadia, you want to add anything, or do you want to? We can continue to the next one. No, for, uh, it's a, I love this work, and we can see that the well, the for me the the best part of this work is when they propose the different scenarios and the possible uh, the future possible workflow it's mm -hmm. very fun yeah i think this is very powerful like especially when you're designing collaboration workflows uh, because there's no guarantee that the same people are going to remain in your team for the duration of the project. They may be needed in other projects. You, you may add new people to your teams. So you, you have to be able to explain not only each step, but like what happens when, when things happen no, in your project and when stuff changes and everyone needs to be able to understand that as fast as possible, but usually they're like complex workflows and complex, uh, interactions that are being assembled. So uh, having like uh, some kind of like base uh, graphic to kind of understand different scenarios and how they play uh, helps a lot to for everyone to be on the same page on a project now. Awesome, well, with that said, let's just pop into, uh, not sure which was, which was the one that we were planning to run now, group five, was it, Oana? Sorry to jump in to you. Uh, uh, okay, let me just share video. Let's see if I can find it quickly. There you go. So this is group five. This is Marisa, Hesham, and Germán. Uh, let's see what they're up to. Good morning, and welcome to our final presentation for the Collaborative Workflow Seminar, where group number five, that consists of Marisa, Hesham, and myself, Herman. Today, we're going to talk about the digital workflow we have created for a studio project called Luna One Residence, that is a residential community in the moon. For this project, we embrace four major pillars, the concept of modularity, adaptability, self-assembly, and individuality. So the idea is that we create a series of modular components that can adapt to the different circumstances on the moon. They can also be self-assembled using digital fabrication and robotics, and you can also embrace the concept of mass production and mass customization. In this way, we can celebrate the individuality of each one of the members of the community. For this reason, we decided we design a series of parts that makes the whole system. And we define three different levels, micro, meso, and macro. Micro level, where we design the parts. Meso level, where we define how the parts relate to each other. And the macro level, that is when we create the total aggregation. For this, we create a rule-based aggregation system that is a stochastic aggregation using WASP, the grasshopper component. And as you can see here, this is a quick diagram that shows how the community grows and evolves based on the needs across the different phases. This is now a project workflow that was started as a single grasshopper script that takes care of the project, the entire process. And then through the introduction of the speckle system, we managed to break this script into four different personas and then be able to keep a live connection of each one of the stages of the process. Due to the complexity of a process and the high, the high level of automation we want to keep, 
we then design an own app. And for this reason, we use human UI. We call this app the Luna Configurator. This config configurator takes care of the entire process. When you start with the client, when they define the site location and position and define the brief, then you pass it into the designer that designed the parts and the components and then define the rules of aggregation using WASP. Then pass it into the engineer that it runs three different analyses, radiation analysis, structural stability, and also distant workability analysis. And then as a final process, once the client approves and reviews, then it goes into the digital fabricator that makes use of Rhino Insight to then create different documentation process and the quantity takeoffs. This is now the screenshot of the Luna configurator. And as you can see here, as you can see, we have five major tabs and each one of them is related to one of the personas of the project. Each one of the tabs takes care of one part of the process, computes the information and then pass it using speckle to the next different persona. Here are the different project roles. We, as we say before, we have four different personas that start with the client that defines the brief, the location, the aggregation, then into the designer that defines the port, the small attributes and the connections, then the engineer that runs the multiple analysis, and then we have the digital fabricate. Now I'm going to pass it into my colleague Marisa, that is on she's on explain more in detail the project workflow. Thank you. Um. So here is a diagram of the workflow and the roles in our speckle stream. We have uh, the client, the designer, the engineer, and the digital fabricator. So the client here would give a site uh, information and uh, aggregation numbers of different units that they would require in the initial volume and the constraints, which then goes on to the architect to um, aggregate these in, uh, uh, in terms of design and in terms of the aesthetic and the looks. And then it goes on to the engineer who will then analyze the radiation and analyze the structural to get an optimized uh, uh, selection of seed. And then when it's, it gets passed on to the client, whether they approve it or yes or no, and if it's a yes, they will then pass it to BIM, which will push it to Rhino and it will be um, gone, it will go to the fabricator for fabrication. So here are the total streams that we have in in this project. Speckle. Stream within the structure that this is because we want to uh, have a easier with uh, easy sending off the data if it's a big data we have give us a starting point and the parts quantity so that the architects can then aggregate them here there is the view the rhino view from from the client of the points and the volume streams and then the architect will then push through uh b reps points and curves for the for the analysis for structural and radiation. And here we see the client uh, review, what is being pushed to the client so that they can make a decision. Uh, the architect stream uh, would have all these uh, different data of the aggregation, planes, B reps um, for each units. And in the engineer, they will be receiving performance report in terms of number value and the visuals of the performance analysis. This is from the architect aggregation. And here is a view of the analysis. So then this is the loop about that, that is able to, we, we are able to do this loop however many times we want, um, depending on the client. If there are changes and comments, it will go back to the engineers and the architects in terms of new, maybe new parts or new location. Uh, so this will uh, allow them to just go on to the configurator and make some changes and then pass it back on to the second loop, back to the client uh, for their review again. And if that is approved, it will go on to BIM. So here we can see that in the case of it's approved, it gets sent on to uh, Rhino Speckle via, it gets sent on to Rhino Insight via, uh, Speckle and 
go to Revit to produce the drawings. Go next. These are the outputs that we are able to uh, achieve from um, to be able to push through to the uh, fabricators, the number of parts and the details of these things. And the structural quantities, the uh, envelopes, and these are the drawings. And Hisham? So now we, we can see like a video for the whole process. For, so the first part is. Hey, Alan, I think I think we're we are losing the connection somehow for, from your side. Oh, sorry. One second. I'll just pause it for a sec and swap myself to my phone for G. Hopefully that will be better. Yeah, there thank you. Go. you. Okay. Not at all. Thanks for the heads up. The design. And then he's sending all of these data. Me, so the start it is start to. I'm just going to roll it back a couple of seconds so we don't lose anything. Uh, and then the architect is start to identify like different uh, parts quantity and the seed values to get the desired uh, solution for this, uh, the design. And then he's sending all of these data so the structure engineer and like other engineers can have it. And in that like engineers are receiving all of these parts and uh, like uh, all of these elements through speckle uh, with receiving these elements. Uh, then they can preview like the model and then they can run different simulations, structural workability simulations and solar radiation simulation. And then going back to the architect to inform the design and then the architect can again uh, change the seed and the quantities and then again send all of these data. And again, the engineers can receive updated data and update them using Spickle and then again, run different simulations to achieve the better solution using values coming out from these uh, uh, analysis data. And then from that data are sent to the BIM theme. So we can again receive all of these elements and using Rhino inside, they can push all of these elements into Revit and then automated levels and drawings are, are exported from Revit and again, uh, another cycle, so like client at the end can receive all of these data using a stream to preview the model on his PC. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. So thank you very much for that presentation, guys. Uh, amazing job, like overall, not only on, on the part that, that belongs to our subject, but like in general. Uh, uh, I think there's a, it's a, a did, you did a very good effort of, of like setting up like the different people that are gonna intervene and how does the client intervene, like explaining how does the client intervene uh, on the further steps of the, of the process and how, how does his feedback can come back to you and you can play around with that on a kind of like loop-like uh, manner. Uh, so that you, are, you are capable of accommodating many client changes and requests uh, without uh, having to do a, a full job. And on a separate note, I especially like your, your UI panel, which uh, is not something that we did a special effort in the, in the uh, course to, to like guide you towards that direction, but it's also like a very nice uh, way to make your work easier is to have a specific UIs to, to handle uh, some extra complex uh, uh, features that you may be wanting, uh, but generally on what pertains to us, uh, very nice uh, work on on the whole collaboration workflow and how you split it up into its individual pieces to make it work. For me, a lot of the, I think the most interesting part of this project, it was very thorough, so I was very impressed by that, but um, specifically the part that I thought was the most interesting would have been the collaboration and the process between the engineer um, and the architect, uh, especially with, um, it would be great to see specifically what kind of performance, what kind of parameters were being analyzed, and if, or if not that, affected the original aggregation scripts 
um, and massing scripts uh, that generated the design. Because I know one of the challenges with these kinds of scripts is that often when you have logic already baked in, it's very hard to adjust with new information. Um, so I think seeing how that pro feedback process, instead of just generating uh, different variations with different seeds, um, like using an RNG in that way, but in a more sort of um, intentional and curated uh, way of taking the feedback from the engineers in their performance analysis um, and seeing how to like more incisively <laughs> decide how to change the design um, instead of having it be so script-based would have been, um, I guess, the next step forward of like seeing how you can like really hammer down the workflow between the optimization and performance analysis and the original um, uh, grasshopper scripts for the design and aggregation of the project. But overall, it was very impressive. Kim, you want yeah, to add something? I, yeah, I, I think that something interesting is, well, it's obviously very well organized. I mean, there are clear roles, so uh, everything is working based on these clear roles and then how the information is moved in between. But all this is related also to the project. So the project is like something that aggregates uh, standardized paths, right? And then you see a process that is like uh, a translation of that. So I, I, th I think this is interesting. Okay, so this relation between the object and the process. So may maybe one question is if uh, a process is valid for any project. I mean, this is something that uh, will be interesting because I see a clear relation between the process and the process. So somehow you're making a design in the moment you're generating a process, you know, a workflow. So, well, it's interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, no? Like how, like you're, when, you're, when you're designing a process, you're actually taking design decisions that may affect the design model that you wanted to create originally, you know? So thinking about this and okay, like hammering it down, it's, it's it's crucial and it's something that that in our industry we haven't done very well yet <laughs> to up to up to today's history. Cool. Noelia, anything else to add or, or should we jump into the next one? No, the next one. Well, awesome. congratulations. Yeah, I was I'm very impressed by the work in in studio and all of your teams, uh, regardless of, of uh, this subject. Uh, but up till up until now, uh, very good job, everyone. Uh, let me see if we can jump into the next one. Mm -hmm. So we've done. Uh, I think we've done group four, group two, uh, group uh, five, and group. If I remember correctly, uh, we will, I will do a final lookout for everyone. Yes, Alan. Group two. Okay, so let's go with uh, group one now, for example. Hello, everyone. This is uh, team one, group one, there you Andrea, go. Alexander, and Yara. And this is our final submission for digital tools for collaboration workflow. So um, just to quickly explain our roles, um, Alex was taking care of massing generation and he was kind of leading the design process and uh, Yara and myself were following his actions. Uh, I would generate a shell for Kangaroo and Yara took care of uh, Revit and documentation. We made, we made four branches in total within our stream. We only used one stream. Um, and um, yeah, in the next slide, you will see the branch workflow. First, we downloaded the terrain into our branch called initial data. And then Alex uh, uploaded um, his massing into the space syntax branch, which uh, both the R and I used further, me to generate a shell. And then, I, and then the R downloaded both of our um, geometries to later push it back to the main um, main branch or stream and of course to later send it to to the mac hat stream for the studio project and so here you can see also the 
the the overall timeline or workflow. Um, uh, I think this needs no more explanation. Let's jump right into this. So this is our site. Uh, we changed the initial site location than what was proposed by Alan. Um, so we downloaded that, and so from there we went off. Uh, this is just an example of how we um, approach uh, the this pinup. And as Andrea mentioned, like we worked on a sub branching system, um, and so this is the example of the initial uh, data branch. And um, it has the information of four uh, data uh, for the colony topography, terrain for this project, building mass, and building boundary. And this was um, pushed back for uh, Alex <clears throat> to uh, use this uh, terrain to implement his space syntax uh, definition. Uh, so here's a quick, uh, uh, a quick diagram which shows how the space syntax algorithm was created and how the functions uh, created by SpaceX were transferred into an actual rooms and with corridors, connections. And uh, later this data, which was organized from the start to the end, was organized and sent using the speckle streams. So I, I took um, Alex's data and um, I posted it into um, a new branch. Um, a new geometry a shell generated following the design of Alex's massing. At this stage, we started to document um, halfway of the project using Revit. So even we know that we need to implement more uh, detailed um, detailed element in the project, we wanted to dive into Revit for documentation. And in this case, we used the receive um, component from Grasshopper and then just um, Push it back to speckle and then receive it in um, in Revit uh, speckle component. Right here, we can see uh, the structural part of our design. I took uh, the uh, uh, terrain sent by Yara, and alongside with the uh, space syntax massing generated by me earlier. Uh, I created the topological optimization for the structure uh, that's uh, settled in the terrain. And for the second iteration, um, there was a new shell that was generated and this time with panels uh, following Alex's design with the top of the structure. So here we are. And this was pushed to the, to the branch, um, to the branch of the shell. At this point as well, uh, while we were working on the uh, iterating the grasshopper definition from Alex side and Andrea, um, we started to define more the documentation in Revit. Also, in this uh, case, we're using um, Speckle Revit uh, to receive the data and to develop the drawings in Revit. There is some kind of uh, components that were uh, used in Revit to, uh, to explain in a diagrammatic kind of approach. And this slide, just in a conclusion, uh, it will just give an overview of how we um, worked with speckle stream in terms of branching system. So we used one stream, but with four uh, branches. As you can see, um, the, the initial data has certain, uh, as shown in the table, and that follows with the space syntax and finally building envelope. And these three uh, streams fed finally to the main one. So once you open the speckle uh, main website, we wanted the first thing you see is the whole project instead of having different commands and different streams. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, awesome work. Uh, let me just put that back. Um, well, I think it's, it's a very nice example of how to do something very complex, like with a very simple approach, not just like a single stream, all of the data lives in one place, you just have different branches that are categorizing that data. And uh, the way that you've structured it so that the main branch or the main place that you can access that data is actually where the final project lives is something that makes total sense and is and it's something that uh, would be done in in the real world no and it's it's it is done in programming projects 
already, no? Like having wherever you go first to be the final part, and then you can go into the its different categories and branches and organization to to look through uh, the, its different parts of the system, no? And uh, so on that side, very good job on kind of like simplifying and, and not overdoing uh, the whole workflow with uh, different URLs. If you didn't need them, it's just like one stream, many branches. If it does the job, it's perfect. And then I also like the fact that uh, even though uh, some of you were playing uh, several roles in the process, you actually made clear that you, you, you were wearing several hats and you were doing one step at the beginning and then uh, intervening again at the end of the process to do a completely different thing and not uh, not kind of merge together those two things now one thing is who does the job and another thing is what what step of the process you need to do so you can interchange your your people doing different jobs if necessary or have someone wearing all the hats of the project if necessary also no? so very very interesting approach there and um, and that was basically it for me. If you guys want to comment anything, Claire, Kim, Noelia. Well, I, I was looking at the end uh, how they converted the whole thing to a private model. And then, yeah, I see no generic shapes. No, no, the next slide. This Last one? slide. No, 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 the previous. The first one that you here. This one? Uh -huh. Yes, this one. So I can see generic shapes, and this is very good. I mean, they are using all um, geometries and objects of Revit, not anything like generic geometry or adaptive elements or anything like that. So I was looking at that, and I think this is this is in fact important because you're using objects of Revit that are especially programmed for this uh, this role are not generic, you know. So I just take a look. This is just some some points I, I look at. Yes, it is a very good point that they've made like an actual effort to uh, creating the most native elements as possible, giving like their crazy complex uh, building. And I, I do love the crazy complex Revit model that ends up uh, at the end. It is <laughs> quite amusing. Elements. Yeah, to me, this is, um, I think this is a very practical and straightforward <laughs> uh, project oriented way to organize um, all the different streams and how you divide each part of the uh, building into uh, conceptually <laughs> that kind of project structure. Um, this is kind of like a, a larger question, but as we've seen a few projects now or observation, um, I think what is interesting and would be a uh, topic to look into is the concept of project forensics. Oftentimes you're so focused on designing the initial project, um, but oftentimes like if you look at the project as a whole, it's important to understand where things went wrong when they do inevitably go wrong. And also um, on the performance side after a project has been built, does the actual performance match up to the initial computation, initial uh, calculations and optimizations that you've ran um, during the design phase, and it would be interesting just on a, on a larger level to look at how the sort of versioning structure and stream organization of the initial project can either enhance the ability to conduct project forensics or to obfuscate it. So yeah, that would be an yes. interesting topic to look into. And I was just thinking with all the different organizations we've seen so far, um, definitely this like process of troubleshooting or forensics would be very different uh, depending on how um, the initial design um, was uh, systematically <laughs> constructed. Conceived, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I guess if, the, if there's a lot of changes, but this happens always, especially in Grasshopper and visual programming environments, like if you don't set your initial data correctly initially and you're missing a lot of stuff and that changes dramatically throughout the project, you run into the problem that your automation breaks every two weeks and you, you, you start wasting more time fixing it than actually working. Uh, so yeah, the, it is a good point to have to be maybe looking to further of like how much did you gain or, or, or how much could you lose by applying these strategies 
correctly or, or incorrectly, you know. Exactly, and where the dependencies are, and therefore where you might introduce like a coupling in systems design when you have uh, things that are coupling when one fails, then everything that's coupled to it will fail as well. So it, that would be interesting to look at from a, like a systems design perspective. Yes, definitely. Definitely very good points. Awesome. Well, let's jump into the next one. Let me just stop sharing this. Uh -huh. So we've done one now. Let me pick one at random. Let's do group nine, for example. Hi everyone, this is Team 9, Kim and Sumer. We are going to present our final project of the uh, digital tools for collaborative workflows. So our objective of this project was to make, make a um, collective building design. So our question was how to uh, develop uh, initial design and how to improve digital design. And then how can we separate task and then how can you use the um, output um, data as, as a compatible model for BIM. So our com collaborative computational design scenario was then was that we using we were we were using a speckle mainly and then he um, Sumer sent me a designed a building and then he sent me and I modified the design and then I sent him and he works for um, um, facade and then windows and more more detailed stuff. And then we gathered every data in, in one stream and then we send it to the Revit. So in the future scenario, probably we can use this Revit data with, to work with um, structure engineer and mechanician and electrician. And then they can send back to, to this data to us by using speckled. So our workflow stream composed by four data, initial data, form data, and then detailed data, and also uh, floor data. So to get started with our exercise here, we, we first started with the initial data stream where uh, we created the Revit topography, the plot outline, and then also a modified version of uh, the boundary volume that we were given as a departure point. Um, this information was sent by myself to Kim um, and this was then also collected. We started merging all of our information in a Revit file at this, uh, right from the start. Um, after which Kim took the information that I sent to him and then he created the form data stream. Um, within the form data stream, Kim created the outside shell that we used for uh, the facade um, and the panelization. And then he also sent uh, uh, the massing that was used to resolve floor information later. So this is where we had uh, a few iterations of uh, manipulations. Um, this information was also then collected inside the Revit merged environment. Um, after this, we started with the detailed stream uh, within which uh, we started to create uh, panelization details on the facade itself, um, and then also window uh, details uh, to be included within the panelization. This was also then collected on the merged Revit file. Um, after this, we decided to add some more information and uh, uh, for uh, a branch within the detailed data stream where we created the floor stream. Um, so we were able to assign uh, levels and floors within the Grasshopper environment using uh, the workflow that the instructors showed us in class. Um, after we did this, we brought the information into uh, the Revit environment where all of the levels were assigned and all the floor plans were created for us automatically. This was a big advantage. In the end, we had uh, uh, the merged file in the Revit environment, and this is a, a sample of what we created at the end. So um, in conclusion, we believe that we think it's very useful tool and powerful. So we believe that if we, if we can use this tool, uh, Speckle, 
with a Rhino inside Revit, it's going to be more powerful um, when we work with families and stuff like that. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a good comment at the end, uh, the actual speckle support for Rhino Insight. It's currently works and not works and it's uh, very shifty and hopefully we will improve that uh, along the way the, of our most stable release. But otherwise, uh, a very good job, very, very nice synthesis of, of what you've been trying to do. Uh, I also like the fact that that like you you wanted to like target Revit directly because your 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 uh, like focus was ending up with an actual Revit model. So instead of uh, deferring that to like the end, you generated your workflow already thinking about this. No, like okay, what we need is to end up in Revit, so we go for Revit every step of the way and we update that model accordingly which I think is a, it's a very good strategy that, that can give you lots of gains on the long run because you can prepare for uh, the, the Revit way of doing things and Revit particular uh, specialities and, and errors uh, that always appear along your project. And if you defer that to the end, you may uh, find out that you have a lot of things to solve in Revit before publishing. Uh, while if you do it along the way several times, you can control that process and, 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 and catch those, those potential errors and, and, and breakpoints. Uh, so it, is, it was a very interesting approach to see the, like the kind of flipping the order and say Revit first and then everything to Revit instead of Grasshopper first and then dump to Revit in the last moment, which are to also valid, completely valid approaches. No, it's just nice to see a, a, a change. I don't know what you guys think about this. Yeah, I think that to have the problems as soon as possible is, is good. So <laughs> since the first day you have the whole process and then you can improve it and then you can do it better and better and better. So you end up with a whole process that works. So I think that this is a very, very good approach. And well, it has maybe some advantages, some disadvantages, but I think it's very good. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I think just <laughs> constraining the project to um, the software that ultimately will be delivering is it's definitely a valid, <laughs> a very valid approach. Um, often, like oftentimes, the, the entire scope of a project is limited by the applications that are um, ultimately going to be used for communication, passing off the design to the fabricators and um, for construction. So, yeah, I think keeping that in mind is um, a very smart way of, of working. Of course, you're subject to the idiosyncrasies and limitations of the software that you use, but um, in a, a real world situation, there is really no way around, <laughs> <laughs> around that problem. So might as well uh, work with it. Yes, if your Beam platform doesn't support something and you realize that nine months into your project <laughs> it's kind of like too late to <laughs> to do anything about it awesome great job guys let's see if we can jump to the next let's do uh I'm just gonna pick one random do, 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 do. Let's do group um, 10, group 10. Mm -hmm. One second, I will put it so I can actually see it myself too. Cool. Hi, we are Shelly, Jaime and Barbara. We are group 10. And this is our presentation for digital tools for collaboration workflow. Um, the content of this presentation is splitted in four main uh, categories: initial and final steps, roles and responsibilities, collaboration workflow, and process in detail. We have this initial step, and this is the final step. So we went from the image on the left to the image from the right, using Speckle to take 
shapes and information and data from one software to the other and back. We made a simulation imagining each one of us would have a different role and different responsibilities. For example, Shelly would be the main manager, setting up the streamed environment, sending initial geometry to respect to the stream, uh, and creating and sharing an initial Revit file with a template. Uh, Jaime would be the lead architect, receiving the initial data, creating and sharing the massing, the levels and columns, and adding also after that the inner walls and the doors. And I would play the facade architect, receiving the initial data, the massing, the levels and the columns sent from the lead architect, manipulating and sharing the new facade, and creating and sharing the rating. Our process, from the beginning, we would receive the initial data, create the streams, each one of them. Uh, the first one, initial data, would already have the content came from this file. And then the yellow boxes are the boxes where, are the processes where we design stuff. So we would design massing floors and steam walls. And the pink boxes are the sending and sharing data. So send data to massing stream with the arm. And we would evaluate if it's approved, go to the next design step, designing facade, sending the, send the facade to the facade stream, evaluating, then go to the change the facade step and send the new facade to the stream. And the final result would be the final building file. So um, these are the, create, the streams that we created for serving our geometries. We started with the initial data that we received, the train and so on. Then the one with the massing design uh, of the building. Then another one where we designed the facade and the last one where we uh, updated that facade and we changed the design of the facade. So um, this is uh, how we split the initial stream with the initial data. Uh, we had the lot as an outline and as a speckle object. Then the maximum volume, which was a closed period and the terrain, which was uh, a Revit uh, topography, a speckle uh, schema object. Um, so in this stream, as you can see, we send, we shared the terrain, the maximum volume, and the lot outline. Then uh, in the massing design stream, we had the floors, which were served as, a, as rapid floors with the rapid levels. Also the walls, which were also rapid walls and were containing information about the levels and the height and so on. And the columns, with, which were rapid columns and were also having uh, the information about the levels. So, this is what we received, the maximum volume, uh, the lot and the terrain. This is how we developed it. And then this is what we sent. The outlines of the walls as Revit elements and the columns as Revit elements also. Uh, here we sent the facade data with the name and type. So the floor and Revit floor and for walls, the walls to Revit walls and Revit railings. So here we're showing that we received the initial data, which includes the levels, columns, and walls. And then we changed the facade at the front. And as a result, we changed the levels and columns. Um, and then we added new railings, which are glass bottom railings. And then we adjusted the floors for the new facade, and then we adjusted the baseline columns as well. So we updated the facade and sent the Revit floors, walls, railings, columns, and doors. So here we received the data and developed it further. We had the railings that we shared, and we changed the some of the facades from regular walls to curtain walls and did the columns uh, and added interior walls and doors. And here is the final result. Uh, 
Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations, guys, for, for the work. Uh, I think it's a, it, it's a, a very nice example of, of uh, how to kind of like uh, a very typical problem in, in architecture, which is that sometimes you model stuff and, and you have to uh, suddenly somebody cuts the facade and does a completely different thing, which wrecks your entire floors and your initial kind of like setup data it goes completely invalid. So you need to kind of like restructure it again and say, okay, we started with this idea, but now we have uh, different floors and different columns that we need to uh, send again. And this would be the final uh, point. And also the fact of that sometimes uh, you're not only generating this new data, which is something that we made a, a big point in the, in the course about, uh, but also you need to update data that already exists, like some walls that you already sent that were perfect, but you just wanted to change the type in Revit or uh, the family uh, to make them dif look different or, or to be more accurate with uh, an analysis that you've made, for example. So it is kind of like nice to see that, that kind of like preparation for these different steps and this dance that you have to do uh, between uh, your different uh, uh, steps of the workflow. And I also liked a lot the, that you very clearly specified who was working on what on your team. So it was very clear what were the tasks of each of your, of your team members. No? So it, once you have that, it's also very easy to assign tasks to different team members because everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Uh, so it makes it uh, more flexible uh, just like with that extra amount of knowledge, you can be more flexible at work without actually having to do anything. And otherwise, very, very nice work. I'll leave more comments to the jury. Mm, well, maybe that uh, I see that there is a design process. If, if I have to understand it, well, I think that there is a decomposition Okay, separation of different steps of the coming of, of the design process. So you start mm -hmm. with the mass, then you start with something more detailed, then with something even more detailed. So uh, this decomposition in different steps is, is interesting because it's a general process. It's not a specific process. So it's interesting because then you add a very strange to say, you know, with a crazy shape and, and it works. So the whole process works. So I think this this may be something interesting. Well, maybe it's it's just uh, my my opinion, but, but, but I think that the the, the whole process is um, is very general. It's very can, can be applied to different projects. Mm -hmm. you know? I think yeah, you could use like this like as a boilerplate to attack several like a, a big group of related projects with the same strategy in your yeah. company. You know, yeah. once you've like polished it further, yes. Totally, totally, I totally agree with that. I think for me, when you're, whenever you're dealing with a new technology, it's harder to, it, it's sort of very much driven by what, how that technology was originally designed. So it's uh, easy to fall into the trap of explaining what you did and harder to explain why you did what you did. Um, so I think in some presentations, it would it would be a lot more informative to sort of hammer away at the why question. So uh, not so much as that we did this and this and this. For this project, um, particularly, it was very clear that it was facade driven. So all changes uh, went downstream from the initial design surface of the facade. You change the design surface, and then you have to change your floor plate. You have to change your slabs, your partitions, etc., to reflect that. Um, so I think maybe that is why it might feel like a very general process. It's very clear to understand um, that workflow. It usually uh, to introduce a major and minor in a project, um, you would have some pushback. So once you change the facade and you have to change your slabs, that changes the total, for instance, um, floor area of your project, and then you'll get pushback from mm -hmm. that. You need to introduce more square, uh, more um, area in these rooms or, or have some sort of like programmatic constraints that might limit the ways in which you can manipulate your facade. Uh, so it would be interesting to see in this process just to give it a little bit more tension what that pushback would look like instead of having a, a strictly one directional change facade, change all these other elements. Um, yeah, 
yeah yeah maybe like we've seen in you know, some other projects to have like a client intervening somewhere around you no know, and kind of like not approving your designs or like complaining about things to that you that you will not be uh, like the, that are typical in your in your typical design process you no know, that you get up to the end and then uh, the one that's paying suddenly shuts down everything and says no no i need actually all of those square meters I wanted, no? So you need to go back and redesign uh, your whole thing. So yeah, that would be interesting to see it, how how would that play play out in the in the whole workflow um, that was proposed, definitely. And if that would inform how they organize their branches and streams in anticipation of of mm -hmm. that as well. Yes, that's a very very valid point, totally. Cool. So let's go to group six now. Let me see if I can find you guys. There you go. And Play. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final presentation for collaborative workflows. We are group six, uh, Amar, Polina, and me, Sachin. Uh, Amar couldn't be here today with us. Uh, he is in Wales, but uh, me and Polina will present today. So our project is Noah's Botanical Garden and Wildlife Reserve. The vision for the project is to create a natural habitat for a certain number of species, which are both plants and animals. Our aim is to design this space over the moon and uh, with varying degrees of volume, gravitational force, temperature and natural light. So here you can see the overview of our project and the different elements. We have an external regolith, the circulation around it, and then the main core, which includes the infrastructure and the spheres. So our project can majorly be understood in two parts. One is the adaptation, and the second is ecology. Adaptation includes the chambers, infrastructure, and the glass core on the left, and the main regular structure, which includes the animal reserve and garden on the right. So these are the main components of our project, which includes infrastructure, chambers, envelope, inner regolith, circulation inside the regolith, and the outer regolith. These are the components for our regolith structure. So we, use, we used Colibra to create the external mesh, uh, to create the eco ecological spaces for the animals. And on the right, you can see uh, the process behind it. So coming to the master workflow, we have a main stream, which is divided into three parts. One is the sphere stream. The second one is regular stream. And the third one is core stream. So the sphere in the regular stream has been done inside Grasshopper in Rhino. And the core uh, stream has been developed inside Revit, which was regularly updated. And then it was sent back to the main stream which was also received by other projects. And if the location of the project inside the colony changes or the other project's location is getting changed, the same process is repeated and the positions are changed manually. So these are the three major softwares which we used. Um, for all the parametric elements, we used Rhino and Grasshopper. For infrastructure and creating the external metabol chambers, uh, the furniture we used Revit and then Speckle was majorly used to send data amongst ourselves and to send uh, to communicate with the other groups inside the colony. So these are streams. We have the main stream, which is the colony stream, and then the three major branches, namely Regolith, Spheres and Core. So talking about the colony stream, it's divided into three parts. One is the sphere, uh, which represents the overall volume, then the massing of the project, and then the LNS connection. 
so this data is received by all other groups uh, on the main site and this is the setup for our colony site uh, on speckle and this is how the colony looks with all the group uh, data now uh, you can see all the uh, all the components for other other groups um, in this diagram this is our setup uh, for regolith branch which includes the outer regolith and the inner regolith both of them are meshes uh, this was majorly uh, created inside grasshopper using colibra and since the inner regolith included a lot of meshes we use list, list uh, access for it here you can see the setup for the regolith branch now coming to the spheres branch it again includes two elements one is the spheres and then the metabol both of them are brip this has been done inside grasshopper this is the setup for the spheres branch apolina will take over so our workflow is um, quite mixed between um, revit rhino inside rhino and grasshopper um, and collaborating to go via speckle. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, as you can see, we have um, two independent uh, models, the Revit infrastructure file, as well as the um circulation around the regolith so these models are absolutely independent from the other ones while the rest of the models are actually rely um on data or geometry from the other files so that um, they build up basically their own geometry for example the metabols or the spheres they pick up um coordinates from the revit file and and they are created around those coordinates Um, so we use uh, similar, um, as we use for, for the outer regulate, so we send the, the data in a separate uh, stream for the core and, and the spheres as well. Um, we use uh, Speckle in, in Revit to send the infrastructure. Uh, but because there was an issue with coordinates, so that was the main issue we we basically faced when using um, Revit Rhino inside Rhino and Grasshopper, um, that there is no such thing as shared coordinates, also especially in the moon. And we had to move our project north in Revit and, and that created a big issue because um, then all the geometry that was in Rhino wasn't picking up that, that movement. Um, so for this reason, we had to come up with a solution, which was basically to create an um, empty Revit file where we received the colony side stream geometry. Um, then we linked with our uh, Revit infrastructure file and we moved the infrastructure to the right spot manually, quite manual process. Um, but once we moved it, we basically binded that link or exploded it in, in that Speckle Revit file. And from there, we basically were managed to, to send it to the, um, to the core infrastructure stream. And uh, since the, the Sphere's uh, Grasshopper file was picking, picking up on, uh, on the rooms, coordinates in the Revit file, then uh, the spheres were also created in the correct spot and were sent in the sphere stream. Um, and from there, it was sent to the whole colony. So yeah, that was all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. I think uh, the, the best point of, of, uh, of the whole presentation is how you managed to to tackle the problems that that you were having and kind of like invent a new strategy to to overcome these problems no it is known that uh, revit has several different issues with project locations project north etc and that that can come to haunt you back 
if it wasn't correctly set and uh, uh, you have to kind of like be able to work your way around the the different platforms to to get them to work as you want so i think it shows like a lot of uh, like uh, originality in, in saying okay this doesn't work with uh, any of the things that i've tried uh, so i'm gonna just like do an extra step on the side create an uh, completely unnecessary in initially revit file to kind of deal with this north change that happened that, that, that none of the platforms you were using gave you the control for no uh, so yeah very well done uh, on that and and in general very nice very nice work on your presentation uh, i think it was very clear like how how were you dealing with the with the different steps uh, of the process and i will leave the rest of the comments to the guests uh, yeah, I think my favorite slide in that was the like the ellipse diagram showing exactly which modules were independently developed and which ones had dependencies, because I think that was a really clear way of um, diagramming the overall system, especially like what what components were the drivers therefore independently operating and which ones were um, responsive to changes in each other, I think. Uh, and yeah, on a practical side, I agree with Alan, it's uh, interesting to see how when the tools that you're using for Interop don't quite do what you want them to be able to do and introduce a lot of manual um, work unintentionally, uh, how do you resolve those uh, real life, <laughs> oftentimes like very, very uh, realistic problems um, that happen and it was good to see a little bit of like um, uh, critique of the the process itself, uh, while while also just explaining how you set it up, but also <laughs> like reviewing like these are the pain points. Um, here's how we tackled that problem. So that was that was also really nice to see. Mm -hmm. Kim, if you want to join in, uh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe just me, but I, I didn't understand exactly how the Revit uh, model and the Grasshopper model, um, at what point they touch each other. So I see there is one part that was being designed in Revit and the other part was designed in Rhino Grasshopper. But uh, like this uh -huh. core, uh, at what moment it uh, enters in contact with the other part? I think this was clear here in the last slide where they were uh, sending the different parts into the last speckle Revit uh, uh, file and how that plays uh, around in, in the different, but maybe, maybe you're right. It could have been kind of like uh, more detailedly or, or better organized. So you could have like a, a better idea of, of, of when when that happens no, and have like a linear linear approach on, on when that happens uh but oh maybe uh, it's just me uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know so yeah no worries now we're here to to comment uh but yeah i think uh for for the context of, of what we were asked for they did uh, a pretty good job but as always uh, it's so once you do the thing you realize that you may be <laughs> Uh, wanting to improve it and it, it's always a good sign no? that there's there's always like way to way to make it better and way to learn from from the work that you've done already cool so let's see that makes it one two four six nine and ten let's go for number three for example oops wrong file And there we go. Hello, we are group three consisting of Amal, Krishna, Pedro and Varun. We will start off the presentation with a brief introduction of our project, followed by our workflow organization, stream generation, entity diagrams and our final output. Just a little bit about the design context. The form we have used is a part of our studio project where our class is proposing a colony on the moon. 
of which our group is building the meditation temple. To share a little bit about our workflow, we have split up the form and the workflow into eight different streams amongst four contributors. These streams divide the form into the exterior and the interior portions. The exterior branch containing of the outer shells, access ramps, and the internal ramps. The interior branch containing of the walls, floor slabs, staircases, ramps, and the stepped well. Eventually, we also have an additional stream that optimizes openings in the external shell to reduce the direct radiation into the structure. With four contributors involved, our workflow is divided into three major sections, consisting of eight streams in totality, feeding into one main stream. The plot stream is first received by contributor one and two to create two layers of the outmost shell, based on which the rams are formed and pushed to the main stream, forming the external temple. Based on the external temple, contributor two and three form different layers of the interior temple. The commits of the interior and exterior temple are received into one main stream, assigned, categorized, and pushed into Revit. For the updation loop, an optimized version of the external shell is sent to the final. Uh, we started with the stream zero, which is the uh, plot uh, given in the class. Um, from stream one to uh, two, um, are, we have created three different streams uh, for the exterior elements. Um, three to um, seven uh, are uh, streams created for different interior elements, and uh, stream eight is for the optimized uh, exterior shell that we did in the end. So we're going to start talking now a bit more about the um, how we did the plot, the plot stream, and the the exterior elements. So the plot, the plot data was was basically bringed in, um, streamed in by the um, through a speckle, um, and um, pushed along uh, with the in in our files. So we could we could always use it as a reference and have it uh, in Rhino in Revit later. The external elements. Um, we we have we have created two, three different elements: the exterior exterior sh shell, internal shell, and ramps. Um, the exterior shell um, in the project is a three D print three D printed regolith structure element, um, which in the uh, it we transform it as or we we uh, build up as a B wrap B wrap. And um, for the building data, we have uh, changed to or uh, assigned um, structural framing uh, exterior in direct shape. Um, the internal shell, it, it, it's it's uh, similar uh, with a difference, which is the um, which is the name. Um, and for the ramps, um, also uh, created in B wrap. Um, which are also 3D printed uh, in the project uh, and uh, pushed into um, into Revit as a direct shape ramp uh, component. So after receiving the plot streams and the exterior streams, we then worked on the interior part of the temple. So we then we, we're going to talk about the different streams involved in the interior. So the interior levels and floor outlines are actually set up in uh, Rhino Grasshopper and then streamed as Revit floors. And the interior wall outlines are streamed as Revit walls. So these are split up into two different streams. Keeping the wall streams and the floors as a reference, another Collaborator worked on the inner temple dome walls, the step well, and these are generated in Rhino and then streamed as spec objects. Also, the ramps and the circulations inside is being created in Rhino, and these are streamed together as a group of spec objects. Here we can see a sample stream of how the plot data is being used to position the data that we are streaming individually. So everything is actually moved to uh, with, according to the data received from the plot stream. 
So finally, all the separate streams are received in one main file, and all the elements which have which are received as speckle objects are assigned Revit categories and sent together with Revit uh, components, uh, and, and sent together in one master stream, which is received in Revit. So this gave us a control of us sending each of these streams and each element separately, and then uh, we could like modify each of these streams before it goes into Revit. So at the final stage, we are updating the loop for optimization. We are using the example of the external shell that could be at best that produce the direct light that is coming inside the temple. And for the optimization workflow, we have received back the some parts of the building as well as the plot. So we could use uh, use it as an underlay for the optimization. Um, the optimized shell gets after sent into Revit as a structural framing, replacing the existing one. So after the master file got updated, the previous shell gets disconnected and uh, the optimized shell is streamed into Revit directly. And as a final result, uh, this is our project on Speckle. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much for that presentation. I particularly like the initial, let me see if I can find it, that, that graphic, uh, which shows you not only the, the different parts that the building is constructed of, but also kind of like it gives you a good idea of uh, how did you split them into smaller parts and what are those bigger parts entailing so you can reference these bigger and smaller concepts in your project, in, in team conversations without having to refer to very technical terms. You can just say, okay, uh, we, if we're talking about the interior branch or the exterior branch, you're talking about all of this system, but you can also refer to individual uh, parts of each of the bigger uh, structure. No? So it, it gives you a very clear idea of how is this project organized? Uh, like in, in like, how does it look like in each of the steps and it, each of its parts and how all of them are organized into a bigger, unit and I also particularly like this graph uh, mostly because it's very easy to to identify who is doing what at each particular point with these color-coded smiley faces uh, so if you at any point had a doubt of who of who did you need to notify of a change or if something went wrong you can always check in your workflow documentation who is assigned to this task so you don't have to go around the entire office uh, calling everyone to, to figure out uh, what happened. No? You can very clearly see, okay, this, this part is a collaborator too, which is uh, Claire or whatever. No? So you could uh, pinpoint very quickly who is responsible of what without being a knowledgeable of the entire system. No? You, you can do your task and still know who's doing everything else. So yeah, and overall, very very nice approach. I like the 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 whole uh, approach in general. Yeah, and I have to say with this one, it's really really clear what the process is, and specifically, there's like in this in this graphic, you can see the phases of development and how uh, the phases of development connect to the the um, parts of the project that have been divided into the stream. So like the first phase you have Shell A and Shell B being the main drivers in exploration. And then that um, impacts Shell C, which then uh, determines the, the interior, um, the innermost uh, core of the project. And then finally introducing optimization in the third phase. So I think the organization was super clear, um, which is, really nice to see and the fact that that relationship between the process, um, the phasing and the geometry was, um, it, it makes it really easy to understand. <laughs> this is maybe like not the most exciting piece of the project, but I really enjoyed that diagram with the stream numbers, <laughs> like the mm -hmm. little uh, chart with the stream numbers and the stream links. Um, Cause that's like 
I guess uh, you could see that as a new age, like the execution plan <laughs> here, instead of having these like file naming conventions all spread out, you instead just have numberings for your streams. So I like I like the um, the clarity of this project quite a bit. Yes. Uh, I, I have the impression that uh, the workflow was based on the building. So first the building was created and then the workflow was designed. You know, so it's, it's like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if, if I'm wrong or not, but I have this impression, right? That you have the shape and somehow you say, okay, I have the shape, so I will create spaces and then I create a workflow. And it, it, at the end, it's very, very clear. It is very important because uh, it's clear the building, it's clear the process. So everything is white, right? But it's, it's, it's interesting because this is like a reverse uh, order. Yes, like since they since most of this actual work was done in Studio One and we concentrated on the collaboration part, some of these things were already assembled. No, so it's like we did like a forward and backward view on on, on the same problem. No, it either you create the workflow or you you already have this thing and you need to kind of like document that workflow correctly, whatever you did. No, so so you could make it better in the future or modify it if necessary so like ideally this this sort of thought process of how to design your workflow will always come at the beginning but the reality is that there is no guarantee that what you design at the beginning would be what you end up with at the end uh, so there's always this i design my workflow for the building and then the building designs my workflow uh, for, with its requirements so they, they're kind of like mutually related uh, but yeah, I think in this case, uh, you could see that they, they had already like designed and had a very clear idea of what, what was to be achieved. So it's very organized and very neatly presented, which makes it all the easier to understand, no? even as a, as a revision tool. No? If you did this on every project that you work on, uh, it would also help uh, in, improve your collaboration on the long run, no, as a, as a company or as a studio. Yeah, I mean, it, it seemed like this process obviously would be closer to the SD to uh, CD phases of a project and um, concept design would definitely require very different organization and a very different um, feedback process. But yeah, I think it's, it's clear because the project has already been achieved a certain level of resolution before um, introducing the the collaboration workflow aspect. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool, very good work, guys. Uh, very nice results, uh, collaboration-wise and, and design-wise. Uh, I really like your projects a lot. Let's see, let me check my cheat list to see who's missing on our presentation. I think we're missing seven and eight, maybe. Uh, let's see. Video. Let's do seven. There you go. There we go. Play. Hi, uh, I'm Naofan. And uh, I'm with Alex and Donga. Today we're going to present about our project. Uh, with the speco. So let me share my screen. And, oops, sorry. So our project, we call it a very happy park. Uh, to remember, we include Alex, uh, Donggap, and me, Nawapan. So we designed it as a uh, the first designer designed it for the outdoor pavilion, the second designer for market, and uh, the third designer for indoor pavilion. This is uh, within the park that we gonna propose. So we set our client brief to, to make our constraint for the design. Uh, the first is the indoor pavilion, gotta have the budget for $10,000. Meanwhile, the second outdoor pavilion is going to have a budget for $7,000. And the last one is the market street included of the $3,000. Uh, 
So our brief, starting with the terrain and boundary, we have uh, three location. We know the entrance location and we know the budget. Then uh, we have uh, communicate about the brainstorming, about what should be our programs. And we finalize our program into three spaces. The market street will uh, go along the entrance A to entrance B and the pavilion one and pavilion two is on the side of the market. And we will take uh, individual responsibility for each program. Then we create a branch of our Spaco stream, including the mainstream, which is gonna be the context and the brief. And uh, the, the, the three others is gonna be uh, based on our individual tasks. So here is our branch uh, structure, the mainstream, conclude uh, the budget of individual one and the context and the pavilion one include our the architectural uh, elements like facade structure furniture as well as the the rest uh, of the branches and on the right side you can see our um, url or the link that we're going to use in the grasshopper script in order to import and exchange our streams uh, object and here is our workflow so we set our workflow uh, very simple. So we got the initial data and we distribute it to each individual branch. Then we uh, assembly into one uh, 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 one uh, file. Then we're gonna propose to the client. If the client say no, we're gonna go back to the initial data and adjust like uh, what is missing. If we say yes, then we the project is already approved for the proposal. So uh, after we have designed uh, something, uh, for example, like um, we have uh, initial based uh, budget for $20 K, but then after we propose to the client, the client say like, oh, we have the financial uh, situation. So they want to reduce the cost to uh, $10 K dollars. So in this case, we also need to extract the data into for each individual program and like uh, use this data as a base for the new uh, design. So here is our initial data. You can see like uh, we have the $20,000 for the budget, including the pavilion one of 10K, pavilion two 7K and the market of 3K. Then this is, uh, then the next one will like uh, we change from 20 to 10K. In this case, the number that we got will be applied to our model in terms of like uh, several um, related uh, ideas such as the size or the number of paneling or the number of material, for example. So in this case, we can automatically update the budget data and the budget data can like uh, uh, automatically uh, put into the algorithm that we create and update the final geometry based on the new data. So here is our uh, structure of the uh, speckle branches streams. The main branch will have like a base uh, including the contact and the budget and uh, we commit the on each branch and use the in this case we can have like a different of the commit uh, number starting from the, the number that we have to talk to the client and, and, and get the final result of the commit number uh, N number. And then we assembly into one grasshopper script file. So here is our final. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I think this is like a, a, a super original approach, uh, but at the same time, super necessary in our industry, which is like, you start with the money and uh, you trickle down what the, you design in accordance of what your client can afford. So if he can afford to buy, uh, to build a bigger tent, you will build it. But if he then calls you and tells you, uh, look, I don't have the money right now to do so. Or the opposite suddenly says, we've got a grant and we now have double the money. Uh, you can actually, you are actually ready 
to to operate with double the money because you you included those restrictions into your workflow as as the starting point of your system and uh, that in realistically speaking that might mean that you need to know very well how much everything costs when sometimes you, this is very difficult to to achieve but it's something that increase it's increasingly more realistic with price databases and and other tools that that are popping up so it's something to to really bear in mind to say okay can i can i actually build what i'm designing no because if i cannot build what i'm designing why are we designing this no why wouldn't we why didn't we make it smaller or or if if you could afford more why didn't you do more no uh, with with that money that you have no? so a, a very very nice uh, approach on the workflow uh, uh, building topic don't know what you think about uh, kim claire noelia oh no, i think it's it's super interesting because there is you have a concept okay and then you have a money slider <laughs> and you say okay this concept with this money bro more money bro okay less <laughs> money just so i think this this, this is perfect I, I i love it okay so one concept this money develop it and you have an offer is able to do that. So, well, it's true that um, it's difficult to make a provision of uh, how much something will cost in construction. So you will not have a precise mechanism probably, but I think that anyway, the idea is, 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 is perfect. Uh, I love it. <laughs> it's a, it's a money-making idea for sure. <laughs> I think uh, I definitely would have liked to see more in detail the precise relationship of how you're calculating the cost, like what parameters are you considering? Is it just material? Is it assembly as well? Is it a dozen, uh, take into consideration fabrication constraints? Is, and the more complex that model becomes, I think the more interesting this premise um, and more ultimately more useful this uh, sort of project setup would be. Um, one example would be, for instance, like uh, the main role of Gary Tech in, in optimization of Gary's uh, designs is that you want to preserve the integrity of the design while reducing as much as possible the fabrication and construction costs, which still usually go at least two times over budget usually. but um i mean it's like an interesting example would be uh like for our king street skyscraper facade um where we use like a very complex uh, surface as a driver for the design um but the the process of uh optimization uh, really like it would be about how can you preserve the fidelity of that surface while reducing the total number of unique angles that are introduced to try to articulate that surface with actual assemblies. So um, that process is interesting because you're reducing costs without necessarily compromising. We're, we're trying to not compromise as much as possible on the original design intent. So I think um, instead of just like looking at it from a, uh, a simplistic kind of, these are the number of materials and the quantity of materials we're using, but also looking at that um, question, that relationship between cost and design, and how do you <laughs> more uh, intelligently reduce costs would be the next step, I think, to push this direction towards. Definitely, definitely, I agree with you that kind of like this would be like a stepping stone, and then you would have to kind of figure out those extra steps that allow you to hyper optimize what you're doing without changing what you're doing. So not making a smaller tent, but making the same tent with less money. <laughs> right. I mean, we've seen like cases of value engineering where you're just reducing a really beautiful surface to a box. And yeah, that is one way to um, reduce costs, but it's not ultimately the most interesting way of doing that. So I think like building in those, um, like on a computational side, like those parameters, uh, from the get-go um, of how you define that relationship between cost and design is is the crux of the, the project. Cool. Thank you so much. Otherwise, very good job. I really like this one. And I think we just have one more left. And uh, let me take my cheat sheet. Uh, if I've scratched everyone correctly, uh, we're just missing number eight. But I will do an overview <laughs> just in case. Uh, uh.
There we go. Awesome. So let's see what's up. Hi, we are group eight, uh, Alexandra and Jonathan and I, Abed. We are work working on Selenu Biohabitat. It's a, a residential uh, on the moon based a growth system with adaptable models. Uh, as a case study, we are going to show and work with uh, one uh, of the adaptable clusters. Um, our initial initial uh, steps um, um, dealing with the massing configuration, and you will see uh, the detailed uh, architecture and uh, the detailed structure at the end. Uh, the workflow uh, consists of eleven uh, steps with ten uh, streams. They will be. Uh, we are going to elaborate uh, more and uh, detail more. Uh, uh, next slide. Mainly, we have a role for three uh, people, one engineer and uh, two architects. Uh, the first step was dealing with um, a context file. Uh, it was a grasshopper uh, file. Uh, it was containing um, uh, a terrain and the plot and the boundary, as I mentioned here. The first stream was converted to a speckle object. The next step was dealing with the, the massing uh, in vinyl. So the massing would be grouped uh, as a list of units and each unit is composed of a center point, a surface of a bureau and, uh, and uh, assigned the radius of the dome. And the units are organized in um, according to the sides. So first we have central sphere, then we have list of smaller units and the larger units. Uh, then we combine those two streams, the context and the massing, into one initial file. The next step is for the engineer to generate a structure using Geometry Gym. So our uh, output from this step would be the list of structural elements, and those objects are composed of the list of lines, which represent the beams, and we are, they are also organized by the size of the units, and also we have two additional objects that contain lines of connectors, connecting the center unit with the larger and smaller units. The next step is for the engineer to do structure analysis. The input of this step would be the list of lines from the previous step, and the outcome of the structure analysis will give us the cross-section of the beams that will be uh, converted and as based on this cross-section will um, produce a native Revit element uh, with the same uh, organized in the same order than the previous um, step, and we will push them as a list of native Revit beams. The next step for the architect one is the generation of, of skin, and um, this time we'll be generating bureaus, and the, the stream will be also organized in the according to the size of the units. So we'll have central sphere, a list of bureaus for smaller and larger units. And um, the outcome of this would be a speckle object containing the skin. The next step is the generation of the openings. So we'll generate the openings in the central sphere. And this time we'll have uh, objects containing windows as a list of bureaus, then the central uh, sphere skin um, intersected um, with the openings and the smaller units and larger units will stay the same. And this will be pushed into Revit generating generic model type windows and generic model type walls. And then we follow the same procedure for the floors. Uh, this was developed by the architect too. So in Rhino, we created a BRAP and then we sent it uh, as a stream uh, to, and where we created this uh, floor native uh, Revit element. And uh, then the architect two, it's as well producing the, the walls. So the walls are divided in, into different groups, uh, the smaller units and the larger units, uh, which they are a list of periods. And uh, just we stream it. And then what we produce, it's a, a generic wall model. Ooh, that then it's uh, received to this uh, 
Revit model. Here we integrate the structural elements, the skin with openings and the floors and the wall strings. Um, here we can see all the elements integrated uh, when we uh, combine all the streams. And the further step is to uh, send from our Revit model a stream uh, to Rhino. And then we make an update in Rhino and we send it back. So here we have an example. We did it uh, with the floors. So we have this floor stream from Revit, which is a native Revit structural floor. We modify it in Rhino with the Grasshopper. And then the output, it's a, an updated floor element, uh, which is uh, first a native Revit structural floor as the, the first layer. And the uh, second layer, we have a floor finish, with, which is a native Revit architectural floor. And uh, we receive back like uh, everything to our general Revit model. And here we have the all integration of all our stream and all our workflow. Here we can see the links for all the workflows we produced and uh, step by step. Thank you very much. Cool, thank you very much. Like I must say, I do love all of these super complex freeform Revit models uh, appearing with their sections and everything. It's super cool to see. Uh, it's something that you rarely see out in the wild. <laughs> you should see just boxes. So it's super cool projects, all of you. Uh, regarding uh, this one in particular, uh, I think you've done a, a very nice job of of actually like splitting down the different data that was required on on the different uh, uh, connectors, uh, like um, different steps of of your workflow, uh, and also um, the that this that step that you that you uh, made of uh, kind of like knowing that there's the, the that what you made was not really correct uh, or may need further improvement in having like that extra step of of improving upon your Revit model, which is something that uh, in a real project you're not going to do once, you're going to do 20,000, 27,000 times uh, in different uh, approximations and uh, re regarding different changes. Uh, so it's something to always have, like uh, be open to and be prepared to to tackle. Uh, but anyway, uh, very nice job and, and very nice result. Uh, I do hope it goes very well in Studio One presentation tomorrow too. And I leave the rest of the comments to the guests. Uh, I see some common points within this project on the previous one because they separated the concept from the development. So, uh, and this is something very interesting because uh, one concept could be developed in a million different ways. And uh, this is very clear in this project because they have first uh, massing concepts and then they clearly split each possible development of, of this uh, of this shape or this massing or whatever it is. So I think this is, this is something very important. And in the previous project, it was similar. I mean, you have a budget, you have a concept, and then you develop it to an algorithm or whatever. So. I think this is, this is uh, very interesting. And in the case of this project, when you see the development of this idea, you have clear roles. So this is also like a very good way to develop it. I think it's, it's, it's a very good idea. Great. Yeah, I'd have to say I mirror Alan's sentiment about it. It's just really nice to see all of this geometry going into to Revit in this project. And, um, particular I'd be interested to see it with the vaulting the structure on the interior when you do need to go in and really refine that detail uh, how does that impact the rest of the the workflow I think it's like those back and forths the kind of like micro <laughs> streaming transactions that you often get when resolving a very specific detail that um, I think this project has a lot of potential to like really explore, at least on the process side, like independently of the design, um, what that what that looks like with such a like articulated structure. Um, and yeah, I think like having a, a case study, like a zoom in on that kind of um, detail or assembly resolution uh, would, would be really interesting to see. Cool, further steps for sure. Uh, but otherwise very nice. 
I also like like the the distinction of like most of you guys have been sending normal walls to Revit, uh, but in this particular case they didn't because I guess the shape that the walls had to get was not that easily achievable in in Revit. So you just kind of like defaults to sending a direct shape, which is already set and and just categorize it, which is something that again you're gonna bump into in thousands of projects that what you want to do is not supported in the platform that you wanted to and you kind of like have to weasel your way around it but still have it correctly categorized as a stair or a wall or a door even if it's not a native Revit door so you could still do a uh, schedules on this and construction uh, planning and like have it have that information on your model even if it's not the most uh, compatible way but it's always better to have it than to not than to not have it. But otherwise, very nice work, everyone. And I think that would do it for our pinup. Uh, not sure if anybody has any uh, of our assistants have any questions or comments or uh, things that uh, uh, you would like to. Um, throw to our jury you know since they are since they're here and you can kind of like grab them feel free to ask any any anything you want and if not we can we can wish you good luck on your studio one presentation tomorrow cool everyone is very quiet <laughs> So very well, very good job, everyone. I'm very happy with the with the results that, that we've seen today, and and I hope you you found this course uh, like a very good introduction to to not only Speckle itself, which is the tool that we used, but also the collaboration pains and and uh, weaknesses that that it comes with, and how you have to kind of like work your way around it. So it, it's not like setting up a collaboration workflow. It's not like the end of your problems is just shifting your problems from a, a very manual way of fixing them to a maybe less manual way of fixing it and hopefully in the future uh, not having to fix them or having a very accurate way of dealing with these issues no and it comes with with time and practice well thanks yeah, everyone thank also Sorry, Hesham, what, 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 you, you both talk at the same time and, and I didn't get that. Yeah, I'm just, thank you. Thank, thanks for free and real seminar. Yeah. Not at all. Thank, thank you, you guys Alan. for, for thank attending. You. Thank you. And for supporting our, our minor issues with the speckle deployments uh, <laughs> along the way. Uh, so thanks for your patience too. Yep. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you and thanks to Yuri too for attending. Thank you. Great. Th thank you so much, Ellen for, and Noelia, for giving the course and for always supporting the students. Um, and thank you for the jury. Um, and I want to give a special thank you to Claire, who joined us so early in the morning. <laughs> of course. It was great. It was, to it was great to have all your comments. And I'm sure the students also learned a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Mayor. Great, so let's wrap it up then. See you Great. guys so, uh, tomorrow. I will be sneakily attending your presentations too. <laughs> you, you, you can openly attend it, you are invited. I, I will uh, 